Oh, okay. there we go. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming. Um, my name's Holly. I'm a grower based currently at Trill Farm Garden in Devon. And uh, as well as growing vegetables and seed there, I also work for the Gaia Foundation Seed Sovereignty Programme. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about diversity. So uh, as we enter 2024, I feel there's a growing sense of urgency for decisive change. Conflict, social unrest, climate breakdown and biodiversity collapse are all happening now. So now is the time for radical transformation into a new and regenerative future. And that future starts with seed. So if society looks to regenerative ways of growing food that builds soil and human health and nurtures biodiversity, consider that these are not resilient until we address the source, and that source is the seed. We've lost 75% of genetic diversity in the last century. Reasons for that? I mean, I'm sure a lot of you in this room are familiar with them, but globalisation of our food system, industrialisation of agriculture, modern plant breeding methods, and also this slide which pops up everywhere, I'm sure some of you have seen before by Phil Howard, also shows the impact of the consolidation of our seed system, of our seed industry. So just to highlight, all of those big circles in red are all chemical companies, and all of the blue are seed companies. So you can see that the majority of seed companies are now owned by chemical companies. Um, I think we're only just waking up to the impact of that. And I'm kind of here today to ask, what have we lost? <laughs> One thing I think we've lost is nutritional density of our food. Nutritional density has dropped dramatically over recent years. Farming practices have led to this decline in nutrient density. But there's also evidence to suggest that modern cultivars are much lower in nutritional value than other varieties. This is a slide um, that demonstrates the difference. This is from the Bionutrient Institute in the US, and they've been doing some amazing work working on this prototype device that basically allows a consumer to assess the nutrient density of their vegetables. And this is kind of a snapshot into some of the data that they've been gathering over recent years. Um, and the difference between, so the 15 times in the grape, is the difference between nutrient density of the most nutrient dense grape they found compared to the least. So you can see some crops, there's real dramatic difference between those that are farmed in quite kind of conventional chemical based systems to those that are grown in more kind of agroecological systems and optimal growing, they're, they're much more nutrient dense, the plant's getting the nutrients that it needs. I think we've also lost resilience, particularly to our changing climate. We grow monocultures, we grow crops that are oh, genetically identical to each other. <laughs> Um, and there's no room for plants to respond to a crisis. I hope my friend Jane doesn't mind me sharing this image, but uh, this is an image of her market garden, Oxton Organics, just a few weeks ago. Um, I'm sure some of you felt the impact of the floods. Um, luckily, she has an incredible agroecological system. She looks after her soil. She's got amazing, healthy, diverse, aggregated soil, and her system is resilient and bounce back from this, but this is a really common scene across a lot of our landscape these days, particularly at this time of year. I also think we've lost adaptability. We've been breeding crops for very specific traits, and by doing that we've potentially limited their ability to react and respond to these changing conditions that I just highlighted. We've kind of been dumbing plants down, and all of this culminates in a loss of health, a loss of plant health, a loss of soil health, and ultimately a loss of human health. This is a bit doom and gloom, isn't it? <laughs> but we can create a new story, and I guess I'm here to ask you what, what story will we choose? Things haven't always been this way, and one key piece of this story is that we haven't always bought seed. There's a deep, deep history of relationship between seed and people that is centuries old. We have, in the past, worked in collaboration with our plant kin. We've domesticated them from wild ancestors, and we've stewarded rather than controlled these crops, and we've selected them based on really localised needs. These subtle genetic changes over generations led to this process of regional adaptation, and a very local sharing of seed means that these crops were regionally adapted. 
It's estimated now that as much as 80% of our seed is imported into the UK. It's grown in climates that are vastly different from our own and without this kind of regional stewardship. This isn't resilient. Although it's not practical to grow everything in the UK, I'm not suggesting we start growing everything ourselves and our climate isn't definitely conducive to growing every single crop here for seed. But we need to acknowledge that we have broken this cycle and therefore we've broken the reciprocity. So, to restore this ability to adapt, we can choose a story where we grow and save our own seed. We can create freedom and community self-sufficiency in local food and seed production. An, import, an important piece of the puzzle is to be growing and sharing much more seed here in the UK. So I work, as I mentioned, for the Gaia Foundation Seed Sovereignty Programme, and we're all about that. We're all about reconnecting farmers and gardeners and growers to their seed. And we work with farmers to empower them and teach them how to grow that seed. And essentially we are sowing a biodiverse, ecologically sustainable and resilient seed system here in the UK and Ireland. There are regional coordinators all over the UK. So if anyone, oh, there's Robin at the back, South Regional Coordinator. So if anyone hasn't heard of the Gaia Foundation Seed Sovereignty Programme, please reach out, check out our website, or go and chat to Robin, who's just through there. Thanks, Robin. <laughs> we can also choose a story of growing, using regenerative methods of growing. We build resilience in the soil, we increase plants' access to nutrition, um, as part of that equation, we definitely need to be saving the seed. I'm really, really interested in epigenetics. I won't go too much into that right now, but epigenetics is essentially the study of how behaviours and the environment can influence gene expression. It's not about the DNA, it's about the layer on top of the DNA, and I like to think of it as a kind of a memory of the plant. So if we're providing these optimal growing conditions and these regenerative systems, we can influence these epigenetics and these kind of genetic memories of the plant and unlock potential. Epigenetic markers are formed in minutes or hours. They're not formed in generations like genetic mutations. So they are these fleeting moments of memory that are passed down through the generations of that plant. So if we provide these healthy environments in these regenerative systems, our plants are going to be inherently more resilient. A stressful, chemical riddled environment, the impact of that is going to be really long lasting. So, to be in a place of real regeneration, we need to be growing and saving our own seed from these thriving agroecological systems that we create. And I don't know about you, but I know which kind of soil I'd rather be growing my crops in. Part of this equation of these regenerative systems is the biology. Setting plants up to do the best they can and perform at their optimum health. I'm going to geek out a bit now, sorry folks. Um, so plants have complex microbial assemblages. They are essentially a holobiont. They photosynthesize, they turn all these amazing energy from the sun into sugars and then they pump some of those sugars out through the roots and that feeds the biology in the soil. And in return for that food, they gain a large percentage of their, of their nutrients that they need to grow. And now we know that plants even consume microbes. So sorry to any vegans in the room, but plants are not vegans. <laughs> they are definitely meat eaters because they eat the microbes. There's amazing research by Dr. James White at Rutgers University. He built on some existing research and him and his team are now diving deep into this world of rhizophagy, which is essentially the plant sucking up the microbes through its root, stripping it of all its nutrients, sending it on a journey through its system and then spewing it back out through a root hair. It's not dead, it's still alive just, and it goes and mines more nutrients, rebuilds itself, and the cycle starts all over again. Research suggests that plants get 75% of their nutrition this way. And this is where regenerative farming practices really come into play. We're facilitating microbially diverse soil. We're allowing plants to create these protective rising sheaths and thrive. We're often investing time, energy and money into improving soil, but then we go and plant seeds in that soil that can't associate with this microbial life because they've potentially forgotten. We've been using breeding methods 
that haven't allowed them to build those relationships. They've forgotten that those microbes can help them. They've forgotten that symbiosis. And we've been removing a lot of those microbes from the seed through our seed production methods. We now know a large part of the seed microbiome is passed on through the seed. It's actually, the endophytes are living on the seed coat. And if we go and strip those through various processes or applying fungicides, then the plant isn't passing those essential microbes on to the next generation. So it really reinforces the importance of saving seed and saving seed locally in local soils. But is that enough? <laughs> so we can grow and save our own seed in a very local system. We can create these amazingly microbial diverse soils and use all these agroecological practices. We can build a community of seed growers. We can build our diverse communities in our soils. But I believe we also need a community within our seed. Sorry about the terrible graphic. Thank you, Camper. <laughs> I think we're unaware of what a truly healthy plant looks like. Our obsession with control has locked these plants away, potentially firmly locked up forever in a cage. We've bottlenecked these genetics, and plants aren't free to express themselves or reach their full potential. I really want you all to consider today the radical possibility of seed. If we release it, if we let go of this idea of purity and adopt a more open approach to genetics, I am absolutely not dismissing the cultural and historical importance of stable varieties. I don't want to dismiss the value of resilient, open pollinated varieties, even F1 hybrids. I think when they're bred in a non-commodified system, they're really, really important, and an important part of the story for the future. But if we're to become open to diversity within each crop, we need to open ourselves up to the vast genetic pool to dip into, particularly in this time of instability. And I think diverse populations offer us this opportunity. Before the commodification of varieties, seeds had no name. We didn't have fixed varieties. We allowed the crops to be less static and more dynamic. So I'm here to introduce the idea of diverse populations. This may be familiar to a lot of you already. Also referred to as adaptive farming. Growing crops as diverse populations allows genetics to roam more freely and opens <coughs> out the possibility of allowing plants out of that cage and allowing them to fully express themselves. I believe subtle yet slow regional adaptation isn't enough. It's not enough in our current world. We're in a time of urgency and things need to happen now. So as part of my role with the Gaia Foundation this year, I've been facilitating a crowd breeding project. So I'm working with a fantastic group of uh, 18 farmers from across the UK and Ireland. And we're working together to curate three different crops. Growing a diverse population means that we're growing locally adapted, genetically variable and promiscuously pollinating crops. You grow crops as a flock, so you choose the varieties that you like. It's important to start with ones that you know or have traits that you know that you want and then you allow them all to mix up. You grow them all out together and you allow them to cross-pollinate and this opens up the possibility of what happens when these crops freely hybridise. You're essentially creating a hybrid swarm and re-pooling all those genetics to see what happens. This re-crossing of genetics and rehashing of genes and potentially forging new microbial relationships allows new traits to be express, expressed and gives us opportunity to have more resilience in our system because things might be presented through that combination of genes that we hadn't thought possible and give us something that's more resilient to our rapidly changing climate. And an important factor to remember is the epigenetic story. We need to be holding seed back from each generation. We're not in a period of slow adaptation. We need to do everything in our power to give these plants the best chance. So if we're holding back some seed from three, four, five generations, mixing it up with the seed and sowing it that year, then we're passing on that genetic memory and it remembers the season from two, three, four, five years ago, not just what happened last year. Because we might be getting a year of extreme drought, we might be getting a year of extreme floods, everything's changing so fast that we need to be doing everything in our power to give, pass that memory on through the seed. This is just an example of a um, flock of butternut squash that I grew out this year. 
So you can see the diversity that's starting to present itself already just from mixing up varieties. Diverse populations appeal to me because they are static. They're, dyna they're not static, sorry. They are dynamic. They fully embrace living in the now. Every plant is different, everything's unexpected. There's a kind of pure excitement to the different colours, shapes, textures and tastes that it brings. It's a reciprocal relationship that empowers both the plant and the grower and allows both to work instinctually together. They offer a kind of freedom. We don't have to accept our current paradigm. We can bring back genetic diversity in four to five generations and through collaborative breeding efforts, such as the projects I'm running this year, this can be accelerated and some of the risk can be alleviated. There's an amazing uh, indigenous seed saver, Rowan White, in the US that some of you may have heard of. And she quoted recently, choose your adventure. And I just love that quote because it really kind of resonates with these diverse populations. They're changing and we get to choose which direction they go in. I think all of this highlights the, the joy that can be found in diversity as well. And that's one thing I've really noticed from growing these crops is that you, you get the unexpected, everything is different. And there's just something fundamentally joyful about that. And I think we've lost a lot of joy in our farming and our growing practices these days. I think for too long we've allowed seeds to become commodified and severed our connections with these crops and therefore that joy. Growing diverse populations is not only an act of resistance, it's an act of healing. It's healing our relationship with nature, increasing our resilience, and most importantly, restoring joy to our farming and gardening practices. Thank you very much. I've probably rattled through that quite quickly because I was quite nervous. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Sorry, the, my... the you said the um, the the, the buy-in, the mycorrhizae buy-in was actually on the seed in propagation. How would it get on the soil up to the seed? Then? So it's there. It's kind. I'm not a scientist, and I've just done a lot of reading and listening about this. Um, but it's not mycorrhizae. It's a form of micro. They're called endophytes. It's a form of bacteria that survive within a living thing. So they survive within a living plant. So when I was talking about that rhizophagy cycle earlier, that are endophytes that enter the plant and they can exist and we've, when we're full of endophytes, everything is full of endophytes. So the plant basically keeps those endophytes and puts them on the seed, it keeps them within the seed. And then there's evidence now in some research that suggests that as the, as the seed germinates, those endophytes colonise the root and then they kind of dictate what goes on in the rise through and what goes on in the soil around the plant because they're saying, hey, we're here, like, our parents told us that we need you, like, we're here and we're to help you get the nutrients you need and then they kind of send out signals to attract more microbes and build that like, resilient riser sheath which gives the plant a real great head start in life. I hope that answers your question. I can't go any deeper into science than that because I wouldn't want to say something correct. <laughs> I'll just take this person here because they just have their hand up. Hi. You might have to shout. Sorry. Great information, but bring it back to the level of an allotment. I can't. If is there another mic? At all? Sorry, I can't uh, quite hear you. I think they're just going to get bring another it mic. Bring back to, to a gardener in a garden. Yeah. Could you give us some ideas in allotments and in gardens, growing veg, for instance? It's really, really easy. It's much easier, actually, to start these diverse populations as a kind of home gardener because you haven't got the pressures of say needing everything to ripen at once for market and things like that which is kind of about often a barrier for growing these at scale or market gardens or larger. Um, you could just choose the varieties that you love. Maybe you've got a really lovely crop, a really lovely variety of carrot that tastes delicious. Actually maybe it doesn't get as big as you want it. So maybe find another variety that gets to the size you want it and then another variety that maybe is resilient to 
a certain growing condition or a certain disease, and then you just grow them all together, grow them out for seed and allow that cross-pollination to happen. And then when you open yourself up to this, you're going to get a lot of diversity and you're going to get a lot of things that maybe aren't edible or don't taste nice or don't perform well. But if you do it over a period of years, and that's why it's great to do it with friends and in collective, maybe on an allotment, because you can then narrow your selection. You need to have a bracket where you're, say, selecting for taste, and you're selecting for size, but you let everything else roam. So you're not narrowing it down like we often do with kind of stable varieties where they have to be really specific. We have laws in this country where we're selling varieties, they need to be distinct, uniform and stable. There's no heterogeneous crops allowed. The EU can now, unfortunately, the UK we currently can't. So that's why all of our varieties we buy have to be very, very stable and all the traits have to be performed in a very specific way. Whereas you can do it yourself and share the seed amongst yourselves. And as long as you've got a couple of things that you're selecting for, you allow other, other traits to roam. And that just brings resilience, because maybe you don't care how big the plant grows. That doesn't matter, that doesn't affect you. So you're only choosing for the taste or the colour, but the plants can get all different sizes, it doesn't matter. And that just gives a bit more adaptability ability and a bit more resilience, because you're not, you're not bottlenecking those genetics quite as dramatically, if that makes sense. Did you have... Yeah. yeah um, you guess. talk more about... You guess. Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, could you talk more about the program you're working on, yeah. the program with the farmers? The crowd breeding project, specifically, or the Gaia Foundation? Uh, the, the first one. The crowd breeding. Yeah, so um, it was something that we advertised just before Christmas, um, and it was primarily targeting people that have been through the Gaia Foundation Seed Sovereignty Programme training. So we do introductory courses and we do an advanced course for community growers and uh, farmers and growers, like uh, market gardeners, to learn the real deep dive in depth of seed production. So you have to have a kind of understanding of seed production um, and then you could apply. And it's for those that are really interested in this idea of mixing up the genetics and growing diverse populations. So we had loads of applications, it was amazing, and selected 18 growers from across the UK and Ireland. Um, and it's a really collaborative project, so they do, they've done similar things in the US, um, and the group of people we've met once, we've decided what crops we want to grow, so we're growing three crops, and then collectively we decide which varieties we know and we like and we think would bring the traits that we want to that crop, we decided on some selection criteria. So for example, we're growing um, a kale, and people wanted it to be like beautiful, which is a really nice trait that Kent listed out, and also really delicious. So we've selected varieties that we know, and then we're gonna, everyone will get that mix of pool of seed, I'll be sending that out to everyone, and they grow them out this year, and we'll be working together to collectively select from these crops, and then that seed will be re-pooled at the end of the year, and redistributed again to the growers, and then they'll grow them out next year, and the process will be repeated and slowly we'll just be honing down, making selections, but not too, not too um, harsh selections. But because there's lots of people doing it, it means that we can select a bit more, we can be a bit more uh, fine-tuned about what we're selecting for, because that seed's all gonna be re-pooled and then redistributed. Um, and the idea is that we're growing kind of more diverse populations that will be adaptable to our, our island, essentially. And the idea is that we can potentially hone that down to more regional groups in the future, so there could be a Scottish diverse population of that kale, there could be a southwest diverse population of that kale, but there'll also be a wider UK population. Any more questions? Yeah, there's a mic just behind you. This is a dumb question. There's no such thing as a dumb question. How do you, with all of this, how do you? That's not a dumb question at all, that's an amazing question, thank you. Um, really simply, taste, like try. I think that's, when I say about this disconnect that we've, that's occurred between us and plants, I think that's a huge thing, is people, even people that are saving seed often don't taste their crops. And we, we know, like we know when things are good for us. We know anyone that grows veg here, like if you eat something 
off your allotment or off your market garden, you know instinctively that that is better for you than something that you probably buy in a supermarket. It just tastes different. It tastes good for you. And if we return back to really embracing that intuition and that knowledge, then just using that taste to help with the selections. And also things like with kale, for example, like we've got that real deep, deep, waxy, kind of green, lush colour. That's like a resilient, healthy plant. And there's going to be all of these secondary metabolites happening in that plant that are then going to be passed on to us as humans. It's up the food chain. So really just like reconnecting with what a healthy plant looks like, what we recognise a healthy plant to be, and just trusting ourselves, trusting ourselves. We do have, we have that intuition. We, we domesticated these crops from their wild ancestors, you know, there's not, not that many generations ago. We've just had this disconnect. So yeah, trying things and really honing your observation. Thank you very much. I'm hanging around all day.